In your opinion, what are your thoughts on website personalization? And do you think it can help with an increased enrollment? I think it can. All you have to do is look at Amazon. I mean, how are they personalizing the experience and, and have been for the last 15, 15 years that if you like this, you might like that. Well, why can't we do that with majors? You know, if, if you like criminal justice, you might be interested in psychology. If you like psychology, you might be interested in social work, um, even to the point of uh, you know, being able to personalize based on geolocation, depending on if they're coming from a certain state, you can deliver a different message. And so all kinds of ways that, that personalization is going to really help. And at the end of the day, it's like, how can the personalization be of benefit and value to the end user? I mean, seeing their name on their website isn't of value to them. I mean, it, it's like the problem that a lot of people do with personalization and direct mail. It's like, I, I don't really need to see, hey, Bart, come to our visit day. It doesn't, it doesn't add value. But yeah. if you start showing me pictures of people that are in the major that I'm interested in, or you show information about students who are from my hometown that have succeeded at your school, that's a value to me now. That's personalization that brings value to me as opposed to just personalizing it with my name, like it's a keychain or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay, welcome everybody to the Marketing Tales show today. I'm with my guest, Bart Taylor, a personal friend of mine and a mentor that I consider a mentor. <laughs> um, he is the president and founder of Taylor Solution, and he is very knowledgeable of, about the higher ed marketing arena. So welcome, Bart. Thank you. It's good to be here, Chris. Hey, so Bart, I did a little bit of research on you, and I noticed that you you earned your BA in graphic design and business from Anderson University. Mm -hmm. um, when did you know that you wanted to work in marketing? You know, I don't know if I would have ever called it marketing uh, growing up, um, but you know, I, I always like to draw, and and I remember having a little newspaper when I was like you know ten or twelve in my neighborhood, and and always had this entrepreneurial spirit and. You know, I, I was the first generation student in my family, and so nobody had been to school before me uh, in college or anything. And so I, uh, you know, I, I learned that, you know, graphic design was a good way to earn a living with, with uh, you know, wanting to do art and draw and things like that. And so I studied graphic design, and then I really got fascinated with being able to solve problems. And, you know, at the heart of marketing, that's what what it is, is solving solving problems to get, you know, brand out there and get awareness and, and uh, help people make decisions. And so you know, I guess if, if your question is, when did I decide to get into marketing? Probably when I was seven or eight, I, I can't remember exactly. I wouldn't have called it that, but that that's always been a part of my blood. Okay. And when you started your, when did you start your agency? Was it in 2011? Yeah. Kaler Solutions was started in 2011. I, I was a co-owner with another agency for the previous 13 years before that uh, here in Indianapolis, but uh, I wanted to focus entirely on, on marketing and for higher education. So that's why I started Kaler Solutions. Why did you choose the higher ed vertical? You know, um, at the you know, throughout my career, I've done a lot of work in, in corporate and nonprofit. I mean, I've worked with, you know, I've done RCA.com. I've worked with Motorola, AT&T, big global consumer brands. I've done a lot of uh, nonprofit work for like Lumina Foundation and American Bible Society and, and other ones. And when I started doing, um, you know, 1998 was the first time I did a, a higher education project for my alma mater, their website. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, I was working on you know, higher ed websites. I was doing work for Motorola. I was doing work selling, you know, packaging for cell phones and, and phones. At the end of the day, I kind of had a lot more fulfillment knowing that I was helping people's lives change with education rather than just selling the next TV or the next, you know, cell phone. And so that's kind of where, you know, when it kind of came down to coming out of the great recession that I really wanted to focus on a passion, you know, I just decided the rest of my life, I wanted to dedicate to higher education marketing. Yeah, you, you figured out your why and then you went all in with that. Yep. Um, since you've been in the marketing industry for a while and it's constantly evolving, uh, what's been one of the biggest shifts you've seen uh, when it comes to marketing higher ed? You know, probably the first big shift was when everybody said, Oh, we ought to start doing a website. Maybe a maybe a school should have a website. So that was like 19 late 90s. So I did the I did my first website in 1994. And then uh, started the Anderson University website in 1997. 
Um, I saw another shift happen in you know 2005 when people start talking about Web 2.0. So the idea of social media and you know Facebook coming on, and so uh, that was another big shift. And I think right now we're in the middle of another big shift with uh, artificial intelligence and what's being called Web 3.0 with blockchain and a lot of those technologies. And so a lot of the higher ed marketing landscape has shifted based on technology outside of higher ed. And um, I think that's, you know, that's the biggest thing that I've seen over the years. I mean, certainly, you know, the demographic cliff coming up is going to be an impact, um, you know, personalization and just the generational changes have been an impact. But I think the biggest things I've seen across my career have been those shifts in technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you always want to be adaptable, especially in marketing. Um, and you mentioned uh, Facebook and uh, and creating a website and one big part of uh, being um, active on Facebook and on your website for SEO purposes and for lead generation is um, publishing blog posts, publishing mm -hmm. content all the time. Um, and I see that you publish a lot of content. So what is your approach to coming up with relevant content, um, relevant marketing topic content for your blog? Um I learned a, a while back, I, I read a book and and uh, it's called um, Utility by Jay Bear. And his whole point is that you want to be useful to people as opposed to just promotional. So mm -hmm. the, the, the uh, organizations that, uh, you know, that, that educate are the ones that succeed, not the ones who promote. And so I learned early on that I really wanted to be someone that educated people through content. And so, um, and a lot of that is answering the questions people have. And so we, um, we meet as a team once every, you know, twice a year to kind of work through and say, what are the key questions people have right now in higher ed marketing? And so we'll put a list together that becomes our editorial calendar. And even, you know, sometimes we'll call audibles. So a couple of weeks ago, somebody said, Hey, chat GPT, we ought to write a post about that. So we wrote a post about chat GPT and Someone else said, "Hey, you you know had Tim Fuller on the podcast about the, the enrollment cliff. We haven't ever said anything about that. Let's write a post about that." So a lot of it's that you know what are people talking about? What are people asking about? What are questions that are being asked about? Uh, the podcast has helped kind of generate some of those questions, but it all comes down to you know what are the questions that people are looking for answers to, and then let's let's write some content about that. Yeah, I listened to that episode with Jay Bear, and I think it was either you or him who talked about the candy, candy, vegetable approach when it comes to content. Yeah, Can yeah you he brought that up. Yeah, what, what, what's that about, the candy, candy, vegetable? So you, you want to make sure that, you know, you're getting stuff that, you know, what they would call clickbait. So kind of the candy is, you know, what somebody's looking for is just something that they want to feel good about when they get to it. But you also have to deliver that vegetable that maybe, mm -hmm. hey, that's not quite something easy that I want to do, but it's something I need to do. And so a lot of times, you know, we'll make sure that the content is kind of following a little bit of that pattern in the sense that, hey, let's give somebody something that kind of makes them feel good about what they're doing, but let's challenge them at the same time. And so I think people appreciate that. I think that's part of professional development. And a lot of the ways I kind of see it, you know, I, I don't, I don't feel a responsibility, but in some ways I do that, you know, I have a, I have a large audience. And so I want to make sure that the content I develop is helping them in their careers, helping them kind of move on to where they need to be from a professional standpoint. And, uh, you know, certainly I need to, I need to make a living and take care of my family and my kids. But if I can do that and be a trusted partner in that, then I think that's a win-win for everybody. hundred percent, hundred percent agree with that. Um, I've heard you say that school, that a school's website is the first and most important tool for enrollment marketing. Mm -hmm. How can higher ed marketing pros make their websites more enrollment focused? I think the first thing is you have to remember who is the website for. I'm a big believer in, in what I call enrollment focused websites. Um, you know, back in the day, you know, 1997, the website was kind of everything for everybody. It was like, hey, let's put everything up there. And, and, and but, but the, the web is, evolved. It's grown. I mean, we have SIS systems, we have internal extranets, we have all kinds of tools now, LMS systems, where what used to just be thrown up on the website is now, you know, put in its proper container for, for the audience that needs to see it. So current students, they're going to need to log into the LMS and the SIS and some of the systems that doesn't necessarily be, need to be on the public facing website. And so that allows us to make the public facing website more of an enrollment tool. Um, and, and because of that, we've got to make sure that the content and the way that we organize the content is, is from a perspective students, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, and their influencers. So don't forget, you know, mom is the number one influencer. And so we've got to make sure that there's content there for prospective students and for mom. And then it's presented in a way that makes sense. I mean, one of the challenges that I see too often is that we basically take the academic catalog. So faculty says, here's our content. And we just copy and paste that and put it on the website. And it doesn't mean anything to anybody other than the faculty and current students, but prospective students, they don't understand what a credit hour means. They don't understand, you know, uh, while it might be interesting, they want to just simply know, do you have my major? Am I going to get a, get a job at the end? And, and what's the outcome going to be? What are other students who've graduated? What are they experiencing? That's what needs to be more about an enrollment focused website where you're answering the questions those students have there as well as their parents. And, and so we've got to be really careful that we just don't copy internal content and put it up on the website. We've got to really make sure that it is designed and organized in a way that a prospective student can understand it. And so a really good example I like to use sometimes is on your tuition page. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at your tuition page, if it's by credit hour, which is the way it is in the catalog, a prospective student doesn't understand that. It's it's like going into a furniture store and saying, I want to buy a table and you know, being told it's $25 a square foot. It's like, well, I don't know how many square feet I need. I don't know what that means. I just know I need a table and chairs. So we've got to kind of adapt the way that we think about the way that we sell higher education. And I know a lot of people don't like business terms being implemented into higher ed, but at the end of the day, we're selling an, a service and our customers are students. And so we've got to kind of get over that uh, to be most effective. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, like you said before, you want to speak to the students and show them that they're, they'll be able to get a job at the end of their time at the university. So social proof is also huge. Yeah. You know, well, we, it's a return on investment. How are we going to show them that? So absolutely. Um, let's say um, the college marketing VP or their team that did the work, they, they tailored their content on their website to be more um, enrollment focused. How does one lead, uh, do lead generation work in higher ed marketing and how do marketers drive prospective students and their influencers to their website? Is it on social media? Is it through influencers? What would you suggest? Uh, there's a lot of different ways. I mean, I've got to, you know, I kind of think that three main topics of higher education marketing include a website, an enrollment driven website that we've talked about. It's that, you know, it's that content that we've talked about. So you've got to develop the content, but then you've got to have some way, like you're saying now, what's the lead generation? What's the, what's the way people are going to get there? Well, they're going to get there through search engine optimized content. So they're going to, you know, you're going to have to make sure it's optimized. And, and I've got this theory that there are three ways students end up at a school. They either end up there based on a legacy. So mom, dad, aunt, uncle went there. And I've, I've, I know that and that's part of part of who I am and what I'm about mm -hmm. Two, it's because of an influencer. So, Hey, I've got a teacher at school that I really like. She went to that school or, you know, my admissions counselor said, I've got to check that out. Or my pastor said, you ought to look at this. So you've got somebody who's influencing that. And those influencers might also be, I met an admissions counselor at a fair. I went to this place and I, you know, met this person. Um, and then the third way is discovery. You know, Hey, I just, you know, I, I was, you know, uh, I saw a poster at school or I went to Google and typed in something in the search engine, or I went to Instagram and saw something that I liked. That's going to be a discovery. So we've got to really make sure that all that we're doing is kind of understanding the, through those lenses to be able to say, okay, if I'm going to, if I'm going to, you know, make sure the influencers are telling the right story, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. If I'm making sure that my content is showing up on search, how do I do that? So there's a lot of ways that I think, you know, multiple ways that people can get there. Um, we have to be creative as, as marketers to figure that out. And we can't just rely on the fact that, oh, we're just going to throw money at, at pay-per-click campaigns and that's the way we're going to build it. I mean, you're reliant totally on Google and or or whatever. And as soon as that algorithm changes or you know, AI takes over and search is is different in 18 months, now you're stuck because you're like, well, what am I going to do now? Because 95% of my leads came through that way and now I don't have any leads. So that's why it's really important to diverse the way that you're getting those leads and, and the channels that you're doing that in. Yeah, that's it. Totally agree with that. Now let's pivot a little bit. During the 2023 Casket User Conference, uh, we had a keynote roundtable discussion uh, hosted by your friend Troy Singer. Mm -hmm. And one participant talked about that many higher ed websites are written using overly formal academic language. Um, 
that is potentially off-putting to the people that come to the to the website, right? Yeah. As well as their their parents. Um, how important is it to use plain language to answer basic questions such as tuition costs, campus life, uh, and how the you know university uh, fits the needs of those prospective students? You briefly touched on it earlier with your example about the making it make the cost more um, visible as well as you know telling them you know straightforward what to expect. Yeah, I, and I think that's part of it. I mean, again. Uh, the biggest mistake that a lot of colleges make is that they basically hand over the keys of the content to the faculty mm. and the faculty do very good things. They, they, they train and, and, and mentor students that they have, but they're not marketers mm. and they don't, they're not copywriters for marketing. And so we can't expect them to write, you know, their, their area of the website. I mean, you know, there's certainly distrib- distributed authorship models where they can content, they can edit content that's been developed, but, I don't think that it's wise to just basically say, Hey, give us your content and we'll put it up there because it is going to be too academic. It's going to be overly formal. It's going to be written at a, you know, at a, at a level uh, that they are representing. That's going to be. And, and really I think a fifth grade level is really where we want to try to write our content. uh, So it's accessible by everybody because keep in mind, you know, mom and dad are going to also read that. And for a lot of first generation students, that's going to be intimidating if they find it too difficult to understand. And so, uh, and as, as we start looking at the enrollment cliff, we're going to have a lot more um, minority families. And so we might have even uh, non-English speaking parents. It's a very big thing in the Hispanic uh, marketplace. And so we've got to make sure that we have content that's going to help them. And so, you know, using plain language, making it simple, um, answering the questions, um, making sure that all of the academic and and college things are presented in a way that's easy to understand. If we need to use analogy, if we need to use stories, if we need to use infographics, figure out ways that you can present the information so that it's consumable and they gets them to take the next step. I mean, too many times we get so wrapped up in making our website kind of really impressive for our faculty or for the other schools in our conference that's not our audience. Our audience is the prospective student and their, and their family. And that's going to be different, whether it's traditional undergrad, the 17 and 18 year olds, or if you're talking about non-traditional where you've got adult degree completion or graduate level or whatever it is, you have to really understand who your audience is and, and create content for them. Yeah. And there are tools out there like Hemingway that you can put your content in there just to see on what, you know, reading level that, that exactly. is and then just adjust and tweak it. Um, Let's talk about personalization and personalization tools on college websites that tailor content to the visitor's needs. In your opinion, what are your thoughts on website personalization? And do you think it can help with an increased enrollment? I think it can. One of the things I've always done in my career, especially when it relates to higher ed, and this kind of came out from my story I told you earlier of, of you know working on my first higher ed website while I was also working a lot with Motorola. It was right when smartphones were coming out. And so the idea of somebody taking a picture with their phone was just kind of mind blowing. And we were, we were developing tools and, and, uh, and websites that would help explain that uh, for the end consumer and for the carriers. And um, one thing I learned is that, um, you know, the, the, uh, the folks at Motorola were, were learning very quickly that they were doing things that were getting, you know, at the time millennials to look at phones and, and want to buy one. And so I was like, well, that we could do that same type of marketing for higher ed for students. It's the same group. It's just a different product, a different service. And so what I learned over the course of my career was pay attention to what corporations are doing, pay attention to what, you know, a Motorola is spending millions of dollars on an ad campaign. What can I learn from them that I can apply over to higher ed? And so I think the idea of personalization, all you have to do is look at Amazon. I mean, how are they personalizing the experience and, and have been for the last 15, 15 years that if you like this, you might like that. Well, why can't we do that with majors? You know, if, if you like criminal justice, you might be interested in psychology. If you like psychology, you might be interested in social work. Starting to develop that kind of personalization as well as integrations with tools like Slate that says, hey, here's what you still need to do as far as what's missing in your application that we need, mm-hmm. um, even to the point of uh, you know, being able to personalize based on geolocation. You know, we're working with a, with a group called Geofly that you know, they can put a piece of code on your website, depending on if they're coming from 
a certain state, you can deliver a different message. And so all kinds of ways that, that personalization is going to really help. And at the end of the day, it's like, how can the personalization be of benefit and value to the end user? I mean, seeing their name on their website isn't of value to them. I mean, it, it's like the problem that a lot of people do with personalization and direct mail. It's like, I, I don't really need to see, hey, Bart, come to our visit day. It doesn't, it doesn't add value. But yeah. if you start showing me pictures of people that are in the major that I'm interested in, or you show information about students who are from my hometown that have succeeded at your school, that's a value to me now. That's personalization that brings value to me as opposed to just personalizing it with my name, like it's a keychain or something. I mean, I don't <laughs> that. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And there's also the important of, uh, you know, get away from stock photos and use more real pictures. Yeah, exactly. Your website. Um, I know besides being the president and founder of Kaler Solutions, you also started the Higher Ed Marketer podcast with your co-host, Troy Singer, which has been so beneficial to me in my growth and my career mm -hmm. at Annan Hill. And you've previously mentioned and talked with Ethan Braden, the VP and CMO of Purdue University. Yeah. His school's podcast, This Is Purdue, um, what are the benefits for university college marketers to start a podcast? Well, they do such a brilliant job on that podcast. And to call it a podcast in the same breath as my podcast is is not fair to them because I mean it's a it's a major production. I mean, it's video. They do a tremendous amount of work. Their host does an amazing job. And and so um what they have done though is they've basically embodified, you know, they they've taken their brand and they've created a podcast that, you know amplifies that, that basically kind of expands that. And so they have, um, they have done that. And, and so, you know, part of their brand is all about the pursuit of excellence, the, the, you know, the persistence, all kinds of things. And so they, they really kind of model that in the podcast, but they've also done it in such a way that they've got um, it's, it's for their alumni, it's for prospective students, it's a wide audience. And so they're telling the stories of Purdue in such a way that is of interest to everyone. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're keeping on brand, they're keeping on target. They're not turning it into a sales tool. Um, and it's the same thing we've tried to do with the, uh, with the higher ed marketer podcast. I mean, even though I sponsor it and Troy's company sponsors it, this, it's not a, it's not a 30 minute commercial. Mm -hmm. It's, it's professional development. It's, it's to, you know, in, in, you know, raise the boats for everybody in higher ed marketing. And I think that's what Purdue does. And so if you're a school, you're thinking about doing a podcast, figure out how you can do a podcast that brings value to your perspective students and influencers. And so I'm working with a really small micro college right now. It's a, it's a tiny Bible college down in, in Texas. And, and we're working on a, a podcast strategy. And the idea is, is that let's build relationships with the key influencers for them. You know, a lot of their students are going to come from area churches. So we identified, you know, here's 250 area churches that we want to build relationships with. Let's invite the people on the podcast, the pastors on the podcast, their entire thing is kind of for their students is unpacking your calling and unpacking why you felt called to go to ministry. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk to each lead pastor about that. That's a natural way to bring them in. Who doesn't want to be on a podcast or be featured in something like this today? You have them come in, you have them talk about that part of your brand. And then that's a benefit to everybody because all of a sudden you're building relationships. People who listen are understanding more about your brand. And I think that's one of the things that Purdue does really well. And I would say, if anybody's thinking about doing a podcast, think about it in those ways, rather than just saying, how can we get more listeners on the show to really you know, promote our, our, our school? If that's your, if that, if that's the way you're going to do it, you're probably not going to last past episode five. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. Um, let's say somebody wants to learn a little bit more about higher ed marketing. What are two books you would recommend anyone in higher ed marketing should read? Yeah, I mentioned one earlier, um, Utility by Jay Bear, and he's been on the podcast. And uh, he probably, his book, when I read that in, I think it was 2014 that I read that book, it kind of just all of a sudden shifted my thought on using content for marketing. I mean, previous to that, it was all about, hey, we got to do a website. It was about the delivery methods as opposed to really how to develop content in a way that really 
drew people to what you were doing. And so that was a big influence. And then the other one was probably Everybody Writes by Anne Hanley, who again was, I was blessed enough to through Jay meet Anne and have her on the podcast and just her um, approach to content marketing. She was one of the earliest people talking about it, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, she really wrote a book that kind of talks about how writing is kind of, it's kind of like learning how to use a computer. Everybody needs to do it. You, you cannot just say, oh, well, we've got writers that take care of that. We all have to be, you know, everybody needs to write. And she is very practical on the way that she does that. And so I learned a lot from her in that book on just my own approach. That was right about that time is when we started, you know, I started weekly blogging. And then obviously that's turned into, you know, over the course of the last eight, 12 years, we've been able to do that. And so uh, that makes a huge difference for that discovery aspect that I talked. So hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm going to have to look into the utility book by Jay Bear uh, for sure. Um, so this concludes our episode. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, probably the best way is either through email. So they can email me at Kaler at Kaler hyphen solutions.com. Or uh, LinkedIn is probably the best way. Follow me on LinkedIn or connect with me on LinkedIn. I, I, I publish a lot of our content there, I'm really active with the Higher Ed Marketer podcast there and uh, always looking to connect and, and uh, network as much as I can. Perfect. Hey, hey, Bart, I really appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your insights. It's been my pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Take care.